I nearly began then with a, an opening that would have echoed slightly Holly Willoughby on the telly a week or two ago, but I wouldn't have been doing it tongue in cheek. I, I, was, I almost did something like take a deep breath. Are you OK? And I couldn't quite remember why that would have sounded so odd in the current. So, and then I remembered, of course, that it would have you'd have thought that I was poking fun at her when I, I genuinely wasn't. I think it is a morning to take a deep breath. Listen, let, we'll approach it as if it had happened an hour ago. All right? We've had most of Friday, Saturday and Sunday to absorb the, I, I think, inevitable um, collapse of, of Boris Johnson. Whether or not it is the final collapse, only only time will tell. But we did Friday's show, actually, quite um, premonitionally. Is that a word? Premonitionally? What would be a better word than premonitionally? Friday's show was quite prescient. There you go. Because we kind of talked about Boris Johnson and Donald Trump as if both had reached the end of their road. I was working on the presumption that the Privileges Committee would set fire to his uh, latest ludicrous attempts to evade reality and uh, and the truth. Um, and then sooner than anyone accepted, uh, expected, they did. He, he got butchers at the report. I'm told it's about a 20-day suspension that he would have faced. And uh, brave Sir Boris ran away as he always does, like like all cowards, always running away. And as I've told you on approximately seven million times on this program, uh, he always makes any decision entirely on the basis of what is best for him in the very short term. So uh, getting to rubbish the report before the report has been published, getting to malign the members of the committee before the members of the committee have seen their report in the public space is the typical act of a corrupt coward, which is what he has always been. Although I accept that it took some of you a little bit longer to understand that and to fully appreciate the depth of his depravity than it took me and many other people who've been listening to this programme for the last few years. And, and what are the last few years, if not defined by Boris Johnson, Donald Trump and Brexit in this country? Three projects stroke individuals that have now been revealed almost completely to be complete Cons, complete cons, con men, con jobs, con artists. Spectacular, really, to reflect that, you know, even people like Andrew Neil were publishing articles under the headline, uh, Donald Trump won't be as bad as you think in the middle of all this mess, while some of us were screaming, screaming, actually, not just from the sidelines, but occasionally from the centre circle, screaming about the direction of traffic. The BBC this weekend still putting Farage back on the telly, still treating him like an honest broker or some sort of valid contributor to the national pageant. Absolutely breathtaking. And then when Grant Shapps lied to Laura Coonsby, about Gordon Brown's dissolution honours list. She, A, didn't notice, and then when she came round to a correction, she pretended that it was only nerds and pub quiz champions who would be interested in the actual truth about what happened when Gordon Brown ceased to be Prime Minister and an honours list was published, as opposed to what Grant Shapps lied about. Later that day, Grant Shapps, of course, who was uh, famous before politics for, or famous when he first came into politics for selling get-rich-quick schemes on the internet under a false name, claimed that he'd voted for Brexit, despite having told us on several occasions in the past that he actually voted for Remain. So it's not a time to celebrate. The damage that's been done is permanent, or at least the stains that are left upon British democracy and British politics are, are not going to be rubbed out by the disappearance, perhaps the temporary dif disappearance of one man. Those three things were off the top of my head, by the way. The BBC's flagship political show, not only giving space to Farage, but also failing to notice Grant Shapp's latest lies, and then when they were pointed out, reluctantly and very sneeringly, claiming that it was only of interest to pub quiz champions and, quote, nerds, end quote. And then the rest of it, Gove doing the rounds today, not really being reminded that he went from being absolutely persuaded that Boris Johnson was unfit to being prime minister to holding about 704 jobs in his various cabinets. It, it, it is breathtaking. And Michael Gove, of course, is the same bloke that went to America to interview Donald Trump without telling anybody that Rupert Murdoch was sitting in the room at the time. So if you're thinking, phew, it's over, we're out of the woods. We're not. We're not out of the woods yet. Rishi Sunak this morning attempting to uh, stick a Gucci loafered toe on the moral high ground while completely forgetting the fact not only that Boris Johnson overruled the House of Lords Appointment Committee on numerous occasions in the past while he sat quietly by as his Chancellor of the Exchequer, but also that he put Suella Braverman back in the Cabinet six days after she was forced to resign for breaking the ministerial code in the most egregious fashion. Pretty Patel heading off. You don't get the House of Lords, do you, if you're a dame? Pretty Patel, there is nothing like a dame. That's probably the line I've, I, I, I should have opened with. She, of course, remained in the cabinet after being found to be a bully. Boris Johnson let her. So I don't know really what, what it is today, but I do know that um, 
Fridays, I don't know if you were listening on Friday, and I can't work too much on the presumption that you were, but it was an odd. I had I'd almost lost my mojo on Friday, and I worked out why. It's because of what I've just explained to you, just because it's now coming down. Those of us who aren't complete idiots do not derive enormous pleasure from drinking other people's tears or reveling in the upset and unhappiness of, quotes all the right people. Those of us who care about this country remain crushed by what has been done to it, remain crushed by the prominence and the, and, and the success of deeply unsavoury individuals like Boris Johnson and stupid, stupid ideas waved through by about 80% of my profession, like Brexit. There's no celebration when you see it all fall apart. There's no celebration when you see justice finally catch up with Boris Johnson, objective reality, finally finding a way to actually restrain him. What, what are you supposed to celebrate? What are you supposed to celebrate? Look at the damage that's been done. Look at our international standing. Look at what the rest of the world thinks about us. Look at inflation. Oh, Germany's got a recession. Yeah, it, the whole point about Brexit is that however bad things are, being out of the European Union would make them worse. So if you think Germany's got economic problems now and you're clinging to that desperate carcass in the hope of pretending that you're not part of the most absurd act of national self-harm in the history of democracy, then you are once again overlooking the fact that bad things are worse when you're out of the biggest single market on the planet than they would be if you were in it. We had recessions while we were in the European Union. Brave Sir Boris ran away, bravely ran away away. When danger reared its ugly head, he bravely turned his tail and fled. Yes, brave Sir Boris turned about and gallantly he chickened out. Swiftly taking to his feet, he beat a very brave retreat. Bravest of the brave, Sir Boris. Should we start with the resignation? I'm going to do this cold. I had a look at it on Friday. I haven't had a look at it since, but I think we can probably, between us, fact check it. Live, can't we? We'll begin here. I have received a letter from the Privileges Committee making it clear, much to my amazement, that they are determined to use the proceedings against me to drive me out of Parliament. That's a lie. For a start, the committee has a majority of Conservative MPs. A majority of Conservative MPs, including uh, Bernard Jenkin and Charles Walker, both, to use that ludicrous phrase that became so popular not long ago, both ardent Brexiteers. A majority of Conservative MPs containing, quotes, ardent Brexiteers, end quotes, simply make recommendations upon which the House of Commons can vote. The House of Commons, of course, maintains a healthy majority for the Conservative Party. So a Conservative majority committee puts its findings before a Conservative majority House and asks them to vote upon the future of a Conservative politician. Boris Johnson clearly decided they would vote to suspend him. I'm told 20 days would have been the recommendation. That prompts the possibility of a by-election. A by-election in a Conservative majority constituency, Uxbridge and Ryslip. So Boris Johnson's claim of being driven out of Parliament hinges upon the idea that a Conservative majority committee can put its findings before a Conservative majority House of Commons and then lead to a by-election in a Conservative majority constituency. Confident that he would lose all three, he lies about being driven out of Parliament. The next line, they have not still not produced a shred of evidence that I knowingly or recklessly misled the Commons. Leaving aside the fact that we all saw him do it, that is an observation of such epic fatuousness that it barely merits analysis. The report hasn't been published, so any claims that you make about it prior to publication must be treated with exactly the same respect as the claims you made about there not being any parties, and then the claims you made about there being any parties but you not knowing about them, and then the claims that you made about there being parties but you didn't know about, and you did know about them but you didn't go to them, and then the claims that you made about there being parties and you did know about them and you did go to them but you didn't realise that they were parties and then the ludicrous claims that you made about it all being relatively innocuous and there's absolutely nothing wrong at all with people living it up on the night that the Queen was waiting to bury her husband they know perfectly well that when I spoke in the Commons I was saying what I believed sincerely to be true and what I had been briefed to say like any other minister. Great sentence, that. Wasn't my fault I told a lie and I honestly believed that it was the truth when I told it. Remember, this is the bloke who said there hadn't been any parties, that he hadn't been to any parties, that he had been to a party and he didn't know that there had been parties and yet he claims that when he stood up and told the 
House of Commons that there hadn't been any parties, that there had been parties, but he, had, but he hadn't realised what he was doing, and if he had, it was all somebody else's fault. That narcissist's prayer is ringing in our ears already, isn't it? They know that I corrected the record as soon as possible, not true, and they know that I and every other senior official and minister, including the current Prime Minister and then occupant of the same building, Rishi Sunak, believe that we were working lawfully together. They do not know that. They categorically can't know that. And if they did know that, they wouldn't have found that you were in contempt of Parliament. And when I say they, I mean the Conservative Majority Privileges Committee featuring two self-professed ardent Brexiteers. I have been an MP since 2001. Incredibly, that's not true either. He ceased to be an MP when he became Mayor of London and returned to the House of Commons only after he'd finished his two terms as Mayor of London. So even that simple sentence there, not even an opinion, it's counting. He can't even get that right. I have been an MP since 2001. I take my responsibility seriously. Of course you do. I let that one hang, frankly. That doesn't even need me to start picking out. I did not lie, and I believe that in their hearts the committee know it. Absolute bilge and really unpleasant propaganda as well, because it's the stab in the back mythology. It's the claim that the people telling the truth are the real liars. It's the pretense that an objective investigation into wrongdoing is somehow motivated by anything other than a desire to highlight wrongdoing. Why? Because democracy depends on it. Why do I say that? Because all we have to protect ourselves from powerful people are rules and standards and regulations, or red tape, as Jacob Rees-Mogg likes to call them. That's all we have as a people, to protect us from powerful people and wealth being free to do whatever they want to do with us, to reduce us to a state of serfdom or, or vassal status. That's all we have the rules, the regulations, the standards, which is why people like Jacob Rees-Mogg are so desperate to set fire to them. But they have chosen, willfully chosen, to ignore the truth because from the outset their purpose has not been to discover the truth or genuinely, genuinely to understand what was in my mind when I spoke in the Commons. So now they're supposed to be mind readers. Boris Johnson's mind, that place where uh, smiling piccaninis dance through his consciousness, that place where women wearing burqas look like letterboxes, that place, Boris Johnson's mind, where lying to wives and mistresses and colleagues and party leaders and constituents is a perfectly normal and acceptable mode of behaviour. Boris Johnson's mind they should have been reading in order to know that while he was actually saying things that were untrue, he didn't really understand that they were untrue because... Well, in my words, he wouldn't know the truth if it slapped him round the face with a wet kipper. The purpose from the beginning has to been to find me guilty regardless of the facts. Again, you can only say that before publication of the report. Again, he makes his decisions based entirely on that nanosecond, that nanosecond of self-interest. Because once the report comes out, all of this falls apart like a cheap suit. But the client journalists, the forelock tuggers and the capped offers have already been given their script. You'll be hearing this script. You'll be reading this script on the front of the mail, the front of the telegraph. That's the script that they've been handed. Kangaroo court, stitch up, witch hunt, absolute rollocks. But it's too late now for any of them to turn around and admit the scale of the deception that they've fallen for. This, he says, is the very definition of a kangaroo court. I think cobblers is the closest I can come to pinning down that particular description. Most members of the committee, especially the chair, had already expressed deeply prejudicial remarks about my guilt before they had even seen the evidence. They should have recused themselves. Well, Chris Bryant did, leaving a Conservative majority on a committee where some members had indeed expressed outrage at the idea of there being parties in Downing Street during lockdown. That's not even an opinion. It was outrageous that there were parties in Downing Street during lockdown. It's not prejudicial to be outraged by the outrageous. It is pathetic to pretend Pretend that you don't understand that, and yet more evidence that you can't even lie straight in bed at night. In retrospect, it was naive and trusting of me to think that these proceedings could be remotely useful or fair. In retrospect, it was naive and trusting of 17 million people to think that you could be trusted with the future of the United Kingdom, or that there'd be £350 million a week to spend on the NHS, or that you would be able to somehow effect a Brexit without having checks on goods coming into or out of Northern Ireland, or that illegally pro pro Roguing Parliament and sending Jacob Rees-Mogg to Balmoral to lie to the Queen would somehow be a breach of behaviour so egregious that action would be taken. I could go on. I could go on. But I was determined to believe in the system. 
I was determined to believe in the system. This is a man who put at least two people in the House of Lords against the express advice of the security services and or the House of Lords Appointments Committee. I was determined to believe in the system. This is the man who lost not one but two independent advisers on ministerial standards because he refused to observe or obey independent advice on ministerial standards. The second of the two, Lord Guite, reportedly left after saying, telling a friend, I've had enough, I'm sick of being lied to. But yeah, that's right. Boris Johnson was determined to believe in the system and in justice and to vindicate what I knew to be the truth. One example, if you've got it, one example from Boris Johnson's entire political career where he could be said to have told the truth in the face of other people's falsehoods. Just one. I'll wait. It was the same faith in the impartiality of our systems that led me to commission Sue Gray. It is clear that my faith has been misplaced. Front page of the Daily Mail after Sue Gray's report was published. Is that it? Question mark. The four lock tuggers, the cap doffers, the client journalists queuing up to claim that that report was a vindication. Queuing up to claim that it was a damp squib, that it didn't prove anything at all and that it was nowhere near grounds for Boris Johnson's defenestration. And guess what? It wasn't the grounds for Boris Johnson's defenestration. His own part Party, the Conservative Party, after the resignation of countless ministers, finally showed in the door because he'd lied about the appointment of a well-known sex pest to a senior role in the Whip's office. It had nothing to do with Sue Gray's report. Of course, it suits the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats and the SNP to do whatever they can to remove me from Parliament. Again, the decision to remove him from Parliament would be taken upon the advice of a Conservative majority committee after a vote in a Conservative majority House of Commons and a recall by-election in a Conservative majority constituency. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, that's only the first six paragraphs. Uh, it constitutes about half a page of a two-page statement. Three. 22 minutes after 10. Where were we? Oh, yes, of course, it suits the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats and the SNP to do whatever they can to remove me from Parliament. The only people who can remove Boris Johnson from Parliament are the constituents of Uxbridge and Ryslip, who would be offered that opportunity if and only if a Conservative majority House of Commons voted to allow them to do so. Cowardice and lies. We turn the page. Sadly, as we saw in July last year, there are currently some Tory MPs who share that view. Absolute nonsense. Ministers appointed by you, some on several different occasions, finally ran out of patience. When you called for support, when you raised your standard in the uh, public space on Friday, the only person who turned up to support you was Nadine Dorries. That's the extent of the base that some bizarre corners of the British media continue to think is somehow similar to Donald Trump's. I am not alone in thinking that there is a witch hunt underway. That bit's true. Nadine Dorries also thinks there's a witch hunt underway. But that Oh, and, and Jacob Rees-Mogg. So we'll give him that one. The first thing, we're on top of page two. I am not alone in thinking that there is a witch hunt underway. And then he loses the plot again. To take revenge for Brexit and ultimately to reverse the 2016 referendum result. A result which, of course, <laughs> he picked a side on the night before posting the column that he'd prepared in advance. My removal is the necessary first step. This is the stab in the back mythology again. And I believe there has been a concerted attempt to bring it about. I'm afraid I no longer believe that it is any coincidence that Sue Gray, who investigated gatherings in number 10, is now the chief of staff designate of the Labour leader. Back to Sue Gray again. Is that it? The Daily Mail front page. A damp squib. Uh, Boris Johnson's allies. It has completely vindicated and exonerated me, Boris Johnson. So how come now is it evidence of some sort of conspiracy when it was actually published and in retrospect found to have gone nowhere near as far as it could conceivably have done, not least because we now know about other gatherings at Chequers and Downing Street which weren't investigated by her but are currently being investigated by the police. How can that possibly be evidence of any sort of conspiracy? If only there was some sort of committee, some sort of independent committee to which the the appointment could be referred and upon which they could then adjudge the suit of... Oh, there is, and they have, and there's no case to answer, despite the desperate attempts of the Daily Mail and various other client journalists to pretend that there was, as, as with Keir Starmer's curry up in Durham. Nor do I believe that it is any coincidence that her supposedly impartial chief counsel, Daniel Stillitz KC, turned out to be a strong Labour supporter who repeatedly tweeted personal attacks on me and the government. Infamy infamy. They've all got it in for me. There are no honest people in British politics. There are no honest people in British public life who haven't been disgusted 
or outraged by Boris Johnson's conduct over the last few years. It would be literally impossible to find somebody honest who didn't think he was despicable. When I left office last year, the government was only a handful of points behind in the polls. That gap has now massively widened. At the time, his personal popularity was, I think, the lowest ever for any sitting prime minister, although presumably Liz Truss came along and overtook him on that score. Liz Truss, of course, his anointed successor after the defenestration. Just a few years after winning the biggest majority in almost half a century, that majority is now clearly at risk because it was built entirely on lies and the lies are now coming home to roost and people are unlikely to vote for the person who lied to them once they realise that they've been lied to, with the obvious exceptions previously mentioned. Our party needs urgently to recapture its sense of momentum and its belief in what this country can do. We need to show how we are making the most of Brexit. How long are they going to need for that? How long are they going to need for that? How long until the benefits arrive, lads? Seriously. This Brexit, this brilliant Brexit that goes to a different school, can you at least describe it to us? Can you tell us what it looks like? I still see it in Idiot's Corner. Brexit hasn't even been done yet. He was your hero. He was your boy for the duration. He was the one that kept feeding you Remainer tears for you to feast upon. And now he's the problem? He's the one who hasn't delivered Brexit? He's the one claiming that we're not making the most of it and we need in the next months to be setting out a pro-growth and pro-investment agenda. We need to cut business and personal taxes and not just as pre-election gimmicks rather than endlessly putting them up. Yeah, because you have a look at the state of this country and you think that you need less money for public services. We must not be afraid to be a properly conservative government. Why have we so passively abandoned the prospect of a free trade deal with the US? Because you don't decide whether you sign a free trade deal with the US. The US decides whether the UK signs a free trade deal with the US and Joe Biden has made it painstakingly clear that they have little or no interest in pursuing that project at this time. If only somebody had warned us. Oh, they did. Barack Obama exposed to racist and evidence-free abuse by Boris Johnson supporters when he described where we would be in the context of a trade deal with the United States as being at the back of the queue. This country, thanks to organs like the Mail and the Telegraph and plenty of people in broadcasting, elected to believe that Nigel Farage had a better grasp of international trade prospects for post-Brexit Britain and America than the President of the United States of America at that time, Barack Obama. The mind boggles. Uh, Why have we junked measures to help people into housing or to scrap EU directives or to promote animal welfare? Where do you even start? Tell me what these EU directives are. How many years did I sit here for? Asking people, Boris Johnson's people, to tell me what the rules were, what the laws were, what the problems were. What is it that you want to get rid of? What are you so desperate to get rid of? And do you know who's just realised what a stupid project that was? Kemi Blooming Badenoch, another ardent Brexiteer dedicated to ripping up red tape, who, when presented with all the red tape that people like Johnson are still claiming that we should be ripping up, ran away and explained that it would be ridiculous to rip it up, something that business has been explaining since the minute that we left. I am now being forced out of Parliament by a tiny handful of people. Let's just go back again. The findings of a Conservative Majority Committee presented to a Conservative Majority House of Commons, potentially prompting a by-election in a Conservative Majority constituency, is the only path by which Boris Johnson would be removed from Parliament. The idea that he's being forced out by a tiny handful of people is a ridiculous narrative designed to appeal to the stupidest, most blinkered people that, well, have ever been permitted to vote in this country, with no evidence to back up their assertions and without the approval even of Conservative Party members, let alone the wider electorate. Put it to the wider electorate then, Johnson. Put it to the people of Uxbridge and Ryslip. Put it to the House of Commons. Put it to the people. See see what result you... Oh, you've run away before that could happen so that you can claim that you've somehow been betrayed and if the people had been allowed to cast a vote, they'd have backed you. The only person that has deprived the people of Uxbridge and Ryslip of a vote on your future is you. I believe that a dangerous and unsettling precedent is being set. No, mate, the dangerous and unsettling precedent was set when you and Jacob Rees-Mogg tried to get Owen Paterson off a hook entirely of his own making. And because that went so disastrously wrong, the idea of the Conservative Party now whipping its own MPs to keep you in the Commons was a non-starter from the start. So once again, you're hoist by your own petard of self-interest and corruption. They tried to save Owen Paterson. It failed. We all thought that was an abject warning in riding roughshod over parliamentary standards. Jacob Rees- 
Rees Mogg and Boris Johnson thought it was just a rehearsal. The Conservative Party has the time to recover its mojo and its ambition and to win the next election. I had looked forward to providing enthusiastic support as a backbench MP. Another lie. He's been causing Rishi Sunak problems from the moment he left Downing Street. Harry Harman's committee, Harriet Harman's committee has set out to make that objective completely untenable. That is a committee with a Conservative majority and containing two ardent Brexiteers that will publish its findings in full for people to read and digest as they please. The only circumstances in which Boris Johnson can claim that he's been badly treated is to get the claim out there before the evidence, before the report. The committee's report is riddled with inaccuracies, he names none, and reeks of prejudice, he cites none. But under their uns- absurd and unjust process, he provides no evidence. I have no formal ability to challenge anything they say. You kind of do, actually. You can challenge what they say when they've said it, and you can tell the members of the House of Commons, you can tell the members of Parliament why they shouldn't vote to send you back to Uxbridge and Rice Slip for a by-election. You've got every opportunity to do that. The only person who's deprived you of that opportunity is you. The Privileges Committee is there to protect the privileges of Parliament. That is a very important job. They should not be using their powers, which have only been very recently designed, to mount what is a plainly a political hit job on someone they oppose. Pour me, pour me, pour me another drink. It is in no one's interest, however, that the process the committee has launched should continue for a single day further. (laughs) So I have today written to my association in Oxbridge and South Ryslip to say that I'm stepping down forthwith and triggering an immediate by-election. I'm very sorry to leave my wonderful constituency. It's been a huge honour to serve them both as mayor and MP. He won that seat, of course, on a promise to resist the building of a third runway at Heathrow. He claimed, of course, that he would lie down in front of a bulldozer to prevent it from happening. But on the day that the House of Commons voted, Voted. For it to happen, he went on a made-up Foreign Secretary jolly in order to avoid the unsightly optics, unseemly optics of him actually voting in favour of a thing he'd promised to oppose. I'm very sorry to do it, but I am proud that after what is accumulatively a 15-year stint, I've helped to deliver, among other things, a vast new railway in the Elizabeth Line and full funding for a wonderful new state-of-the-art hospital for Hillingdon, where enabling works have already begun. Uh, Is that one of the 40 hospitals that he was still boasting about as he was chased out of Downing Street? I think it probably is. I also remain hugely proud of what we achieved in my time in office as Prime Minister, getting Brexit done. Let's just go back to, to the same actual letter of resignation. We need to show how we are making the most of Brexit. So have we got it done? Or, or, or have we not got... I mean, is it going well? Or is it... Not? Anyway, he's boasting about that. He's boasting inevitably about winning the biggest majority for 40 years without mentioning the lies upon which it was constructed and delivering the fastest vaccine rollout of any major European country. It started the fastest. It was quickly overtaken. And you know who's in the paper today? Reminding us that he called Boris Johnson grotesque. The actual husband, the former Boris Johnson ally, Jesse Norman, the husband of Kate Bingham, who probably takes more personal responsibility for the success of our vaccine rollout than any other human being in the country. She, well, is presumably too discreet to put her memories on the record, but her husband is happy to. And the word he uses to describe Boris Johnson is grotesque. Another one of the ministers. Um, I also remain hugely proud. He's very sad to be leaving Parliament, at least for now. He can't help himself. That's like Hasta la Vista, baby. But above all, I'm bewildered and appalled that I can be forced out. You weren't. Anti-democratically, it wasn't. By a committee chaired and managed by Harriet Harman with such egregious bias. And that is the single most pathetic contribution to the public record by a former or sitting prime minister that we will hopefully ever have to endure in our lifetimes. I think someone else should speak after the very latest headlines with Thomas Watts.